think so. No, it's on. Okay. We wait a bit still, Banu. Banu, should we still wait a bit? Start now. Okay. So, can can I be heard? So, after the uh, introductory talk on Monday, which was intended to really be um, a once over very lightly of what the coupled cluster method is and, and what it can do. And I try to give you a, a broad overview of both the method, methodology itself and the uh, very diverse array of uh, problems in many areas of physics. What I want to do today is to hone in on today's talk and on Fridays on the particular applications to the very, very big field, actually, of uh, quantum magnets, in particular frustrated quantum magnets, uh, in, on uh, spin lattice problems. And what I want to do today is to take a particularly simple and yet highly non-trivial example um, as a tutorial example where we can actually see how the method works in practice and do the first couple of steps on the not exactly on the board, but on the, on the transparencies together. So the, 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 um, the, uh, tech, the, the model that I'm going to talk about is a spin half icing chain, one dimensional chain in, in a transverse magnetic field. Here's the outline. I'm going to talk about the, uh, the model first. Talk about the difference between the classical case, which is totally trivial, and the quantum spin half model, which very, very rarely for these, this, this class of problems, these spin lattice problems, has an exact solution. And that's why I'm going to use it as a tutorial example. But the, 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 the number of such examples is really a set of measure zero. So this is, this is one place where we don't have to rely on any other uh, technique or Monte, quantum Monte Carlo or anything, we've got an exact solution. And that's why I'm going to, going to use it. It's one dimensional. And I should stress from the beginning, this is not really the class of problems we're interested in. These days, the, the interest is essentially completely on two dimensional systems, two dimensional or higher. Um, but I'm using the 1D as a, this model as a tutorial example. So then I'll describe the coupled cluster method again in a bit more detail, going into a little more detail than I, than I did on Monday, talk about the results and, and uh, end up with uh, a discussion of what we've got. So let's look at the icing chain in a transverse field. Um, let's take, it doesn't matter, let's take the ferromagnetic uh, 
chain. So we put the coupling, so we've got a, 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 a pure icing term, not Heisenberg, right? E much, much simpler, just a ZZ component. So that by itself, without the, without the field, is trivial because it's a it, the, the 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 classic the, the classic solution and the quantum solution is a pure ferromagnet. The ferromagnet the uh, is a is an is a um, uh, is also an eigenstate of that Hamiltonian without the lambda. But now we put on a perturbative field, and of course these two terms and the field is transverse. These two terms no longer commute, so it's now all bets are off. Um, to fix, let's say we do it with periodic boundary conditions, so we just make it into a ring, uh, and the side n plus one comes back to side one. But what I'm interested in is the thermodynamic limit when n goes to infinity, and so these boundary conditions shouldn't matter anyway. Um, I've set the, uh, the only important thing here is the sign. Any factor here, that of course, there should be a, a coupling constant, but that just sets the overall scale. So I've just factored that out. And so lambda, the field, is measured in units of the, of the, of the icing coupling. Um, so it's, got, it's only got one parameter. OK. So when lambda's 0, we've got a pure ferromagnet. It's a doubly degenerate ground state all the spins are aligned along the plus Z or the minus Z direction. When lambda goes to infinity, all of, the, all, of the, all of the spins are aligned along the field direction, and it's a non-degenerate state, okay? Call this a paramagnet. Uh, this is the common terminology. What it really, all paramagnet in this sense just means that all of the order that was present in the ferromagnet has disappeared. Now, what about classically? This is a, about as simple a problem as it comes. Um, so suppose our spins still have a, have a length half, but they're classical spins that can point in any direction, not just have the projections minus a half and plus a half. So what happens is kind of obvious. You start with lambda equals zero. The spins, let's say, you choose to be all pointing down. Now, as you turn on the field, they're just going to slowly cant in the direction of the field, okay? So let's say they cant at an angle alpha, and um, so we've got the energy, is just the, the number of particles. Let's come back to our Hamiltonian. This just picks up uh, that the Z component is now cos alpha, so this is minus cos squared alpha. That's this piece. It's S squared is a quarter. And the other piece is just the X component, which is proportional to sine alpha, and the the um, and the uh, the S here is just a half. So that's the that's the classical energy. What's the actual uh, What's the actual um, state that's realized? Well, we minimize with respect to alpha. Okay, that can't doesn't come any simpler. Differentiate, set the, differenti the, the derivative equal to zero, and you find that sine alpha is equal to lambda. That works clearly only when sine alpha has got to have a magnitude less than one. So that works for lambda less than one. And after lambda is big, when lambda is bigger than one, the spins all align in the x direction. So they down, turn on lambda. Lambda equals one, they're in the field direction, and as lambdas increase further, they stay in that direction. So we've got a classical phase transition at lambda equals one. Doesn't get any simpler, right? That's why it's a tutorial model. And the classical values of the magnetizations, these are the properties now that we're interested in. Um, we, want the, we want to know what's the uh, magnetization in the Z direction. That's just proportional to cos alpha. And that's this expression here. And what you see is that this, this is now the ferromagnetic um, order parameter. Okay. And this, uh, this is um, 
going to, I think this probably the pointer is not working. Um, this goes to zero at lambda equals one. So this is the classical phase transition. And above lambda equals one, the order parameter has gone to zero, and that's why we call it a paramagnet. Okay, so these are the two order parameters. Now, what happens in the, in the quantum case where the spins are, are real quantum spins that only can have a projection minus a half and plus a half? It turns out this problem, um, it's been known for, I don't know, 50 years, yeah, Mr. Freuty in 1970 solved this problem exactly. And the way it was solved, you first turn the spins, in, you, which you can do on, on, uh, uh, in one dimension, turn the spins into equivalent fermions, that's the jordan wigner transformation. You then do a Fourier transformation from lattice position to lattice momenta. You then do a Bogoluboff transformation and you diagonalize and you get the answer. So I'm not going to go through the exact solution because it's not of interest to us. It's just to know that there is an exact solution and this is how it's obtained. Now, it's very important to realize it's completely trivial. This model possesses um, a, a Z2 symmetry group. The Hamiltonian is invariant under the Z2 symmetry group. And that's just the unitary operation of flipping spins in the Z direction from up to down, right? That was obvious because the Hamiltonian was quadratic in the Z, Z, in the, in the Z components. Um, and it's the breaking of that symmetry. Phase transitions always occur because a symmetry is broken. And it's that symmetry that is broken. So what we see is that in the paramagnetic case, that symmetry is preserved. But in the ferromagnetic case, it's not, because it chooses a particular direction at random, either all up or either all down. OK, it's extremely simple. But that is the cause of the phase transition. OK. Now, what one, so let's, uh, where is this phase transition? Well, you go through the exact, um, you go through the exact uh, solution and you find that there is an expression for the, um, actually you can solve this problem both for finite n and for infinite n. This is the solution for infinite n. So this is the energy, the ground state energy as a function of the field strength the energy per particle. And of course, the energy should be an extensive variable, as we, as, as we, as we said. You can't get it any simpler than that. That's a, a second order elliptic integral, and that you just have to do numerically. But of course, if you just want to do it numerically, it's trivial. Um, where's, the, where's the phase transition? It's not obvious here, because this is an expression for all values of lambda. But if you look at this, if you look at this um, carefully, you, you see that um, at the precise point when lambda is equal to a half, so when lambda is equal to a half, that square root is one plus two cos k plus one, and cos k can be minus one, and so that square root can go to zero, and what you find is exactly at that point, it's not obvious from here, but you just stare at it a bit, and this expression is non-analytic, that's easy, at lambda equals a half. And that is where the phase transition is. So this lambda critical is a half. Now that is dramatically different from the classical case. The classical transition was lambda one, this is lambda is equal to a half. So there you see immediately this problem is not as trivial as it looks. The Hamiltonian's dead simple, but the classical and the quantum cases are entirely different. So, uh, and please, I should say again, feel free to interrupt anywhere along the line, both in audience or anybody online, please. Hey, here, it, 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 it's an integration variable. It doesn't matter, but in fact, it's a lattice moment. It, it's, a, it's, it's a momentum on the... Uh, it's a lattice momentum. And zero to pi 
is the first Brillouin zone. I mean, it's one dimensional, you know, it doesn't get any simpler. It's, it's a one dimensional crystal. And so K is, uh, is a continuous variable as N goes to infinity. And this is, this is essentially the first Brillouin zone. Sure. All of this, I should say, all of this uh, is zero temperature. So we're talking about zero. I could, on top of this, I could introduce temperature, and that's an and that's a that's a complicating factor. But let's start as simple as we can. This is zero temperature. So in the language, this is a phase transition, not in temperature, but in terms of the tuning parameter. Yes. Y yes. Hang on to that. Hang on to that thought, and we'll come. We'll come back to it. it. Where can it be? It's got to do with quantum fluctuations. But and I mean, I think you answered your own question. But we'll see how it comes in rather precisely when I come to do the coupled cluster uh, 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 um, solution for this problem. So hang on to that thought and ask again if I haven't answered it in twenty minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, we don't only have the energy. I mean, the solution is exact for the wave function. So for the given that we've got the wave function, I can also calculate properties. And in particular, I can calculate the magnetization, which I can compare with the classical results. Um, before I do that, it's easy to confirm that both the energy and the first derivative are continuous at lambda equals a half, but all higher order derivatives go to infinity at lambda goes to a half. That's, it's intuitively, it's rather straightforward because when you differentiate with respect to lambda, that square root that's in the numerator, one piece of it goes into the denominator. And when, and when that can go to zero, that's what's giving you the infinities. The first derivative, it's not enough, but any higher derivatives, you're building up powers of the square in the, in the denominator. And at lambda equals a half, all of these higher derivatives go to infinity. But it's continuous, and its first derivative is continuous. That's what we mean typically. That would be what you would call a second-order phase transition. Now, the classical and the quantum expressions look totally different for the energy. Um, but they, and we know that, they, that, that where the phase transition is, is completely different. But these two expressions differ actually very, very little. In the most important range, which is between 0.5 and 1, that's the, that's the range for, for the difference in, in transitions, they only differ by about 6 or 7%. And everywhere else, they're much closer. So if you only look at the energy, you wouldn't really see the difference. So you've got to do something more careful. And that's typically always what you have to do. Or the, the properties show up phase transitions much more than the energy does. So we've got, um, we've got uh, uh, this result. Let's have a look at this dramatic difference. And let's have a look how it is reflected in the, um, in the, in the magnetizations. But let's just first say, so the, the, the spin half model is characterized by at lambda equals zero, we've got perfect ferromagnetic order, doubly degenerate, all spins up or all spins down. So it's broken that Z2 symmetry of the Hamiltonian. That twofold degeneracy is maintained as lambda's increased all the way up to a half. And then suddenly at lambda equals a half, the ferromagnetic order parameter goes to zero. And above that, the ground state is non-degenerate. So we're back preserving the Z2 symmetry of the Hamiltonian. Okay, It's about as simple a, 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 a breaking of symmetry as you get. But anytime you break any symmetry, it has this dramatic effect. 
It's worth pointing out that both the paramagnetic and the paramagnetic phases are gapped. What that means there is a finite uh, amount of energy that you have to give the system to go to the excited state, except precisely at the, at the, at the quantum phase transition where that um, gap, that's called a spin gap typically for these problems, goes to zero and the mode becomes soft which means you can put in an, uh, in an arbitrary number of excitations there, and that's what causes the phase transition. That's another way of saying the same thing. Okay. These are the exact results for the, uh, for the magnetizations. In the icing direction, you get a, a relatively straightforward um, expression. It looks just like the classic expression, except for two things. Instead of being one minus lambda squared is one minus four lambda squared because of the difference in, and the power is dramatically different. Classically, that power was a half. Here it's one upon eight. Why it's one upon eight, don't ask. It just comes out of the mathematics, okay? And for the transverse direction, again, you are down to, you are down to a, um, uh, another elliptical integral, this time of the first kind. And again, you can see that this is non-analytic at lambda equals a half. It's continuous at lambda equals a half, but at lambda equals a half, every derivative is infinite. Okay. I'll plot these for you later. Rather than do it now, I'll compare with the results that we're really interested in, the results from coupled cluster theory later, okay? So now let's talk about how we'll solve this problem using the CCM, please. Yeah, it, it, but it's continuous here because precisely at the same point, the numerator goes to, goes to zero. So this is, it's non-analytic, but it's it's finite at at, at lambda equals at lambda equals uh, a half. But every derivative is infinite at lambda equals a half. It's very easy to see. Just start differentiating. It's very easy to calculate this at um, at um, at lambda equals one half. This integral just becomes. I think it just becomes one upon pi. It, it's a trivial integral. You you can do it. It's it. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's right. I mean, at lambda equals a half, all of these integrals actually become doable. The, 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 I mean, it, it, it's the special case of the elliptic integral that can be done. But it's, that's always what happens with elliptic integrals. Yeah. Not translation symmetry. We've always got translation symmetry. It's the Z2 symmetry of flipping all the Z spins up or down. It's not trans, tra it's, this is always translationally invariant. I've put it on a ring to make sure that it is, but it's infinite anyway. So that, that, that's important. We'll come back to that. So the only symmetry that's broken is the Z2 symmetry. Translational symmetry is preserved by my boundary conditions for N finite. I make it into a ring. And uh, in any case, for n goes to infinity, it's, you don't see the ends. Is it clear? Okay. So let's look at the coupled cluster method. Um, as I said on Monday, just to remind you, it's by now, it's one of the most pervasive, most powerful and most accurate of all um, ab initio formulations of the uh, microscopic quantum many body problem been applied to more systems in quantum chemistry, field theory, atomic, nuclear, subnuclear, condensed matter, and any other area, many other areas of physics than any other competing method. And it's yielded numerical results that are among the most accurate available, often the most accurate available for a very wide range of, of both finite and, and extended systems. I gave you a uh, a, a taste of some of those on Monday, um, where the method has got the most practitioners 
is in, uh, is in quantum chemistry, atoms and molecules of interest in atomic physics and quantum chemistry, where the, where the method is regarded as, as, as the gold standard. And in this particular field, you've got amongst the world's experts already on your, on your faculty here. Um, now, this widespread success that was, um, uh, let's say, from this point up, all of these are, are, um, are systems defined in a spatial continuum. And um, I don't know, some 25 years ago, uh, I was motivated to ask how, what about systems on a regular spatial lattice rather than the continuum? Can we continue to use this model? Um, and, and I was actually, at the time, I was interested in doing, I, I was interested in doing QCD, on, on, which is also, of course, typically done on the lattice. Um, Almost all QCD calculations are you, uh, that to date are done via the Lagrangian approach, and this is an intrinsically Hamiltonian approach. So it was interesting to ask, are we going to gain anything? Um, I rapidly became convinced that, um, that uh, SU3 is, is, I mean, it's, it's an interesting problem, don't get me wrong, but there is only one problem there. And there's lots of complications that come about because the theory is non-abelian, but it's got very little to do with anything else. It's just immensely complicated problem. Um, I'm not trying to downplay it, but it's what, what happens in when any of the QCD community tries out a new algorithm, they try it first, typically on spin lattice problems, uh, because these are simpler, and, they, and they, so they hone the methodology there. But it rapidly became clear to me that the spin lattice problems of which they're now, instead of just having one theory of QCD, you've now, or one model, you've now got a huge variety of models of this, of which we're doing just one here, and I'll do another one on Friday. So I rapidly t turned my attention away from that, although we made some progress in in um, SUN on, on, on the lattice, if N is one, U one, you're doing lattice QE, QED, um, et cetera. So we're now gonna hone in on quantum magnetism. Now let's come back and, and stay general for the moment. And um, let's go through again the rudiments of the coupled cluster method, what I'm now gonna call the normal coupled cluster method. So just to remind you, the ground state psi is written in terms of a reference state phi by an exponent is by sitting in front with an exponentiated operator. And I went over in quite a lot of detail on Monday what that exponential did. And what it does is it does proper counting of multiple excitations. Um, we saw that we did not like to do the bra state. I mean, what you would think immediately is you would just complex conjugate and you would write this, the complex, uh, the, the Hermitian conjugate of this as phi bra and then e to the s dagger. I convinced you that e to the s dagger is not something that you really like. You perhaps prefer e to the minus s and I will go over that again. But to turn that in, to make that, because e to the minus s and e to the s dagger are not the same, we make them the same, sorry, we don't make them the same, but we force their difference to be contained in this operator s tilde. Now here I'm putting hats on everything just to you know, be totally pedantic about this and to make it clear. What we want is that this s operator with respect to the model state phi, the model state phi should now be a generalized vacuum. Doesn't mean it is a vacuum, it's a generalized vacuum with respect to which there are a set of, of creation operators. This index i is a set index. I went over the example of a closed shell atom or a closed shell nucleus, where this index i counted one particle, one hole, two particle, two hole, three particle, three hole excitations. All I require from th this is that these guys, um, 
these guys, the, whatever these, these operators are, is that they mutually commute amongst themselves. So if I've got a state phi and a set of these that mutually commute, I'm in business to do the coupled cluster method. And I'll show you what the, the, this for the, for the problem we're doing is, is, is trivial. We have, as I said before, we have broken by doing this. Um, if I were not to make any further approximations, this S tilde operator would be identically equal to this. So in an exact theory, that would be the relationship between S tilde S and S dagger. When I make approximations, that may no longer be true at a given level of approximation. And so at a given level of approximation, exact hermeticity is broken, but it comes with the very big advantage that at any level of approximation, I can I satisfy the Hellman Feynman theorem. And that means that properties are calculated, ground state properties are calculated to the same, with the same level of, uh, if you were doing diagramology, if you were doing many body perturbation theory, we're not, but you would be calculating with the same set of diagrams. And because that set of diagrams you know is good for the energy, by construction, it's all the proper counting, it's going to be good for properties. And conversely, if you insist on hermeticity, you must give up the Hellman Feynman theorem. You have your choice, right? You pays your money and you take your choice, but you can't have both, except if you do the problem exactly. Well, if we could do the problem exactly, we wouldn't be standing here, right? I mean, this one we know we can do exactly, but in general, we can't. Okay. Um, now, for this problem at hand, let's just take the ferromagnet as our model state. That's the, that is the exact state at lambda equals zero. Now, what you know then is that as, as lambda becomes non-zero, when your quantum fluctuations start to enter, what happens is that some of these spins that were, that were down, all down, start to get flipped up. One flip, two flips, etc. And that's what I'm going to count in these operators. So these, these eyes here are now products of flipping a downspin up. And I can do it on one site, two sites, three sites, etc. And if I count the lot, I'm exact. Okay? It, and it's obvious that these guys mutually commute because they're only because S plus commutes with itself. Yeah? It's, I, I think it's very straightforward, isn't it? Please, if, if there's something isn't, just ask. Because the only complications now come in when you do algebra. If you understand this, all you have to do is some algebra. <laughs> okay. What I've said is each one of these spin raising operators, and you know these are just S, Sx plus Isy, the usual SU2 spin raising operators. If you're dealing with a spin half system, you can flip it once per site, and that's it. If you try to do it twice, you get zero. Once the spin is up, it can't go more up. If it's spin one, you start down, you flip it once, you get the, uh, the, the m equals zero, flip it twice, and that's as much as you can go. And that's the only difference between the spin now is a quantum number that we can handle quite easily. It's just the number of flips per site. I'm going to stick with S equals a half. But I could equally do spin one, for which there is no exact solution. OK. How will I calculate these coefficients? Because if I know these coefficients, I know everything about the ground state. I will extremize the expectation value of the Hamiltonian with respect to, to them, and I get this set of equations for the, for, the, uh, for the ket state coefficients and this set of equations for the bra state coefficients. The index i, there are, we, in practice, we're going to approximate by taking a subset of all of, the, of, of all of these set indices i. But once I've, once I've made a truncation, let's say I've got, I've chosen 500,000. 
Then I've got 500,000 coupled nonlinear equations to solve. And down here, because this S tilde only comes in linearly, I've got 500,000 linear coupled equations to solve. And that is about what we do these days, maybe a million, maybe two million. That's about what we can do with available computing power. And I'll come back to that. <clears throat> Let's look. The only place where S ever appears in these equations, here, here, and here, S only appears in this, I've highlighted it in red. It only appears in this form of a similarity transform of the, of the Hamiltonian. I said by contrast, if I had done hermeticity, that e to the minus s would have been replaced by an e to the s dagger, and that similarity transform would have been a unitary transform. Why do I like similarity transforms much better than unitary transforms? And the, the reason is, is here, because if I have the similarity transform, there is a, there is a, a well-known um, expansion for that, which is just the nested commutator expansion. And I know the nth order term, right? It's just one upon n factorial times the n fold nested commutator. By contrast, if that e to the minus s were e to the s dagger, there is no closed form expression. You have the horror of the baker campbell hausdorff expansion. And furthermore, that will never terminate. This one will terminate. Why will it terminate? You will see, um, you will see in, a, in a moment why it terminates. But basically, what happens with each commutator is one of the operators in S. Now, remember, S only contains spin raising operators, S pluses. This Hamiltonian contains S pluses, S minuses, and S zs. Now, when I do this commutator, one of the S pluses in here will meet a, a, an S minus counterpart in here or an S z part in here on the same site. The SU2 commutation relations tell me what that is, and everything else will be zero. Now I do the second commutator. And what happens here is that this S plus operator can never find, uh, can never, uh, find a non-vanishing commutator with another bit of S because they all commute. So it can only come back to here. And when you do a finite number of these commutations, the, the SU2 algebra just tells you this stops. And in particular, for this particular Hamiltonian, it stops at the level here. And I'll show you that in, in, in practice in a moment. That's the whole idea of doing this tutorial example. I'll show you every step. Okay. So what I've said is the goal, the, the, the couple cluster method satisfies the link cluster theorem. That tells you the energy is gonna scale properly like the number of particles. And basically it says there are no unlinked terms. Unlinked terms can only occur when, when one of these operators is linked to itself and not to the Hamiltonian. It can't occur here. If this is e to the s dagger, it can occur. And it causes all sorts of problems above and beyond the fact that it, the series doesn't terminate for, for s dagger. Okay, so you've got two good things come from the similarity. Termination, which means you don't make an approximation and um, the, the link cluster theorem is automatically satisfied. Very importantly, it's automatically satisfied at every level of approximation. Okay, not just in the exact theory. And similarly, I, I'm not proving it to you, but I'm stating it to you. The Hellman Feynman theorem is also exactly satisfied by this parameterization at every level of approximation. I'm not describing it here. Very similar parameterization also exists for excited states. If anyone's interested, I could go over it. But for these purposes, I'm not going to look at uh, excited states. So the only approximation that we're ever going to make is to truncate this set I. Now on the lattice, there is a very natural way of doing this. These are 
um, in particular, this problem is an almost all spin lattice problems. The, the Hamiltonian is very local. Typically, you are correlating nearest neighbor, sorry, the Hamiltonian contains interactions between nearest neighbor pairs, maybe next, ne next nearest neighbor pairs, maybe next next nearest neighbor pairs. But that's usually as far as one goes. These are short range screened interactions, if you like. Um, because of that, it seems reasonable to describe what I call this L sub M scheme. L is for local. Um, and what we do is we carve out on the lattice all regions of N contiguous spins. A, con a set of spins are contiguous if every one of them is nearest neighbor to at least one other. In graph theory, if you know any graph theory, that would be what you would, an nth order set of contiguous things, points on the lattice, are the lattice, are what's called the lattice animals, or in another language, they're the polyominoes on that particular, on that particular lattice. So what you do is you first cal you calculate all of the dimension n lattice animals, and then you flip the spins in all possible ways it, within that lattice animal, and you do it up to size four. And then you do it up to size six. And then you do it up to size eight. Then you do it up to size 10. And you say, do I have any more computing power? Typically, these days, on two-dimensional lattices, we go up to 10. Now, in the language of quantum chemistry, that would be in, including 10 particle, 10 hole, which is totally, totally, totally out of the question. But this on the lattice, you can do in this localized fashion. So it's quite important. And, and these higher order excitations I will show you are very important. Oh, what happened? Did I do something or? Just touch it. Where? Sorry, I'm being obtuse. All oh, right, sorry. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> and at each level, um, this, uh, as I said, at each at each level, at each of the, each of these L sub M levels, the CCM operates from the outset in the n goes to infinity limit. So even though I'm carving out finite regions to flip the spins, it's for an infinite lattice. And remember, what this operator is exponentiated, so it sets that, that e to the s, it sets that number of flip spins down an arbitrary number of times on the lattice. So you're really flipping, at any level, you're flipping an infinite number of spins because that s is in the, op, is in the, is in the numerator. It's exponentiated. And then for the ground state, we calculate the, um, the uh, obviously we calculate immediately the ground state energy. And then I can calculate also anything else I like. And in particular, because I'd like to compare with classics, I'll compare the, or, the, this uh, magnetization both in the icing direction, the Z direction, and in the transverse direction. Um, and if I was doing excited states, I would calculate the gap to the lowest excited state. Now, the only approximation I now need to make is I would like to extrapolate to the M goes to infinity limit because I know I'm guaranteed if I go M to infinity, I'm doing exact. So by now, because we've done scores of these problems. I mean, literally um, uh, 20, 40, 50 of these, of these different um, highly interacting and not non-trivial, not, not, not cases like this, examples. And what we find is we can't, I would love to be able to prove these scaling laws. Um, I've discussed it with, with many colleagues and we can't come up with an actual proof, but, but empirically, um, the, 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 these properties scale very simply. You always find the energy scales like one upon m squared, or it's a power series, one upon m squared, one upon m to the fourth. 
properties, no great surprise, always, are, are, it's always easiest to get the energy. It's the same in perturbation theory, right? You do perturbation theory for the energy and you get, uh, uh, if, it, if it converges at all, I showed you an anharmonic oscillator that never converges, but if it converges at all, it converges rapidly, whereas properties converge more slowly. And typically we find the order parameter scales like one upon M if we're, if we're in a, typically in an unfrustrated case, or if we're in a frustrated case, or importantly here near a quantum critical point, it goes even more slowly, goes like one upon root M. I don't have any reason, I can't prove this to you, but I can tell you I've done 20, 30 models and it always goes like this. So there's something, something here. That is the only approximation that is ever made. Okay. So let's have a look at the let's have a look at the the results. So I'm choosing the model state to be this ferromagnetic state, which is exact when lambda is zero. So that means the correlation coefficients have all got to go to zero in this limit. Now let's do L sub one. L sub one says, I'm just going to take this state and I'm going to flip one spin anywhere along the chain. That's your translational invariance. Okay. Well, here it is. It's, a, it's an S plus operator. There's one N, N sites, but every one of those has got the same coefficient. So I'm using the lattice symmetries. Here, the only symmetry in one dimension is, is invariance. The point group symmetry is 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 just is just um, is just uh, translational invariance. So that there's only in 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 the one body L sub one limit. There's only one coefficient I have to solve for. Okay, so that we ought to be able to do by hand, and we can. So let's remind ourselves the SU two spin commutation relations are written down here. An S plus and an S minus commute to give me an SZ, and only when they're on the same site, if they're on different sites, of course, they, they, they commute. And, and SZ commute, um, commutator with an S plus or a minus gives you back an S plus or an S minus. And I remind you of the nested commutator expansion. So let's plug that into here. Let's replace S by this. Simple, right? It's only one operator. All right. Well, it's, it's trivial to prove the, that the similarity transforms of these individual operators. Obviously, S plus, it's just S plus because every bit of S commutes with S plus. Here, take this, go back to this commutator here, right? So we start, uh, we start. Um, we start um, with, we're now doing the, the similarity transform of SZ. So we start with an SZ, and then we have the, the commutator of an SZ with, uh, with an S plus, which is an S plus. And anything higher, because I've always, at this level I've got S plus, anything higher is zero. So that's this one, full stop. Right now, the, the hardest one is S minus. So instead of H, put an S minus. First one is S minus. The second one is an S minus with an S plus, which is an SZ. And the next one is an SZ with an S plus, which is an S plus, and everything higher stops. That's this. Okay. Now, all I have to do is to, here's my, here's my, um, I started with, an, with a Hamiltonian that was SZ, SZ, and an S plus. Um, uh, sorry, an SZ, SZ, and an SX. An SX is proportional to S plus plus S minus. <clears throat> so the field piece, which was, do you remember it? It was lambda s k x sub s i x subbed over. <clears throat> Let's write the Hamiltonian.
minus lambda and then it was SI plus, sorry, SIX in the, in the transverse direction and SIX is proportional to SI plus plus SI minus. Yeah. So this, this bit is just SIX, possibly up to a factor of a half, depending on how you, how you define these things. I've, 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 defined them, I've defined them here somewhere. Um, no, I guess I haven't written it down, but I think with, th with this definition, I think S plus is, is a half SX plus ISY. Okay. So this piece of it, we can see that bit of it. Now, when I do the similarity transform on this bit, the S plus goes to S plus. That's this guy. Yeah, there's the factor of a half because previously that was minus lambda times SX. And what I've said is that SX is one half of SI plus plus SI minus. And the SI minus, the similarity transform comes from here, and that's what this bit is. And up here, I've got this product of two, uh, two operators from here, and I just put in here, and clearly I get the term from, this is now the same with uh, this guy multiplied by the same thing on site I plus one, and I've just multiplied it out here. Okay, any questions? Sorry, say again. This, this one? Yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing this guy, right? I'm doing the similarity transform on e to the minus s. Now it's, it's this, s i z, s i plus one z, e, e to the s. In here, bung in e to the s, e to the minus s. So, so it's the, it's the product of, that, that's always the nice thing about similarity transforms. The similarity, pro, the similarity transform of product is the product of the similarity transforms. Yeah, I mean, e to the s, e to the minus s is by definite, is the unit operator. Yeah? Okay. <clears throat> All right, and now, now I'm calculating now I'm calculating the, the ground state energy. And the ground state energy we've already seen is obtained by sandwiching this guy between the model state, taking the expectation value of this operator in the ground state, in the model ground state. That we prove it. So let's come back to here. Now, where will we get non-zero terms when I sandwich phi on the left and phi on the right? Well, the, this guy is going to give me zero because when he, any S plus operator here, I can let him act to the left and he gives me zero. So this guy is going to give me zero. This guy is going to give me zero. This guy is going to give me zero. Um, this guy is going to give me zero, um, um, and, on, on, and on and on we go. The ones that are not going to be zero are the Zs. But that's easy because the spin operator, when it acts on a phi, all of the spins are pointing down by definition. So when one of these acts on the, on the model state, it just gives me minus a half. So bear that in mind. And we've got two terms that are left over. Minus a quarter, which comes from here. This is minus, and each one of these becomes minus a half. So it's minus, minus a half, minus a half. That's minus a quarter. That's that one. And then we've got a bit 
um, which is here. And this is minus lambda upon two times two A, that's A times SIZ, which is minus a half. So we should have minus a half uh, lambda A. And there it is. Coefficients. Coefficients I've, I've shown you to get this coefficient, I have to sandwich this guy with the guy that created the, this, co, this coefficient, but acting on the left. And now I've got this. So I've got, I've got a sandwich and SI minus. So let's try and see what is preserved. I've got an SI minus. The SI minus can own, will give me a non-zero term when it meets an SI plus. So this term will contribute, this term will contribute. Um, this term will not contribute because there's too many of them. This term will not contribute, this term will contribute, um, and, and that's it, okay? And I think we can see that there's a term proportional to A, um, which is, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is, uh, which is where, which is, which is, um, which is this guy. Um, the SI might, there's two of them. There's two of them, so I should get minus 2A. Um, and then there's an SIZ in there as well. So that gives me the A. And then there's the other piece. So you don't want me to do every bit of this. I think you can see the pattern that's, that's building up, right? It's quite straightforward. It's a little bit tedious, but this is lowest order. You can imagine when you go to 10th order and you've got, I don't know, 100,000 coefficients, it's terribly, terribly tedious. So you don't do it yourself. You teach your computer to do it by computer algebra. So that's what we have. Um, we, this is a quadratic equation. It's got two solutions. So how do I know which solution to choose? Well, I've already said when lambda is equal to zero, this guy must go zero because when lambda is equal to zero, the ferromagnet was an eigenstate. And indeed, that's the one with, when lambda goes to zero, it's the one with the plus sign here and not the one with the, with the minus sign. That gives me the ground state energy. That can now be compared. This is a trivial approximation, right? So this can be compared with the exact or the classical. Uh, we will in a, in a moment. I'll put graphs up of all of these. It's got the right limits as lambda goes to zero and lambda goes to infinity. It's got exactly the right limits. Please. Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah, we'll have we'll have a higher. I mean, if we if we st if we stay with ten thousand coefficients, you choose which ten thousand you'd like to keep. We'll have ten thousand nonlinear equations in ten thousand unknowns. Yeah, I'm, I, that's why I'm only doing the lowest order analytically, right? <laughs> sure. No, no, it doesn't, because you take, you take the expansion of, of this, and this is one plus half lambda squared, and that cancels, the lambda squared cancels with the lambda. So this goes to zero as lambda goes to, it's zero upon zero, but it's a, it's a smaller zero in the, in the numerator. Okay. Same thing for the bra. Um, again, I've only got the, 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 the S tilde operator was one plus the excitation. Now, the excitation operators, right? These are spin lowering operators because they act to the left. Only one coefficient, again, translational invariance. They're the same on every side. Um, speed up a little bit. Now you've got a little bit more work to do, but it's, uh, I, this is every step, right? I mean, I've not omitted any step here. So you've got to, you've got to calculate these, these non-vanishing pieces in this, expect, in, this, uh, in this matrix element. 
and there are um, again there are there are different bits that you've got to you've got to keep. Just look at this. All I, all I've done here is just to to, to impose this the similarity transform again. Um, this was just as we did it before. And where are you going to get non-vanishing pieces? Well, the unit operator has got to meet something over here, which is also doesn't have any spin raising operator. So that's just that bit. Um, and, and so it goes on. The S minus has got to meet an S plus counterpart. So it meets it here and it meets it here. And that's what these terms are. Here, you've just got, you know, this is non-vanishing because it's at the same site. You first flip it up and then you flip it back down again. And if you don't remember what this is, I calculate it for you. This is, this is one. So you've got the expression you need. Uh, there it is. And what we said is we've got to extremize this with respect to everything. We weren't, now everything is two, A and A tilde. Vary with respect to A tilde, and you get the same equation as we got before. That was guaranteed. Vary with respect to A, and that now gives me the equation for this guy. And already, I've already solved for A, solved this equation for A tilde, and there it is. And then you calculate uh, any properties you like, but for this guy, you, you've, got to do, you've got to do this. Again, you've got the same thing, and you find this expression, you bung in the values and you find this. And the same thing for the transverse. So we've got at the lowest order level of approximation, which is about as trivial as it comes, we've got closed form expressions. Now, as you go higher, all we do now is I just keep adding more and more terms, right? So in 1D, this is the, the, the lattice animals are as simple as they get. In 1D, it was one site. In 2D, it's two nearest neighbor sites. In 3D, it's three nearest neighbor sites, etc. And so we go up, I, I could go very high in this. Just for these purposes, I'm going to go to 12th order. This you can do easily on your, on your uh, th this takes no computing power at all. This you can do on your, on your, on your laptop. This doesn't require fancy computing. Um, what you have to do in general, and you can imagine doing this in two dimensions, is now, uh, complicated is not the right word, but much more time consuming and tedious. Because what you've got to do now, for example, on a square lattice, the, even if we stop at, um, let's say we do L sub four, now we're on a square lattice. Now there are one, two, three, four in a row, that's a size four animal, but that's another one. That's another one. That's another one. Is that a separate one? No, it's not because of reflection symmetry. So we now, we, we throw that away and I say, oh, that, I'm not throwing it away, but if I build in all of the symmetries, it's there. Now you have not just translation symmetry, but you've got rotation symmetry, reflection symmetry. And if you're on a hexagonal lattice, you know, it's much more complicated. So but you teach this to your computer. And what you've got to do is all of these calculating these matrix elements, you've got to find, because you do e to the minus s, h, e to the s. You put in those bits of s, you have to calculate that similarity transform. All it's doing is multiple, multiple commutators. You teach your computer to do that algebra. You teach it the SU2 algebra, right? And then you've got to take overlaps with the guys you started with, the patterns of spins you've started with. That's a pattern matching problem. To do that by eye, it's horrible. You know, you can imagine when you've got a 12th order animal, and, you, and it's, it's a complicated looking guy. And you say, if I got, where's that match? Where's, that's what we had to do here. We were looking by, by eye to see where can we get non-zero terms. 
Well, when you might not see this guy immediately, you might see its reflection or its rotation. So it's, this is not something you want to do by hand, but your computer doesn't make mistakes if you write the right program, of course, right? So you teach your computer to first calculate the lattice animals, do it with all the wrong spins, do the, so that's the number of coefficients you're keeping. At, uh, for this problem at L sub 12, we're probably, I don't know, 10,000. It's not that many. Um, as I say, for, for typical problems in 2D, where we go up to the same order, it's about a million. Um, you, de you derive the equations using this pattern matching procedure, and then you solve the equations. Um, Typically, we do, as I say, these days, we're doing, we can do problems with about, uh, about a million um, uh, configurations. It's a million nonlinear equations in a million unknowns. I mean, if you ever to write those equations down, you don't, you store them in your computer, but it would fill up probably all of the volumes of FizzRev that have ever been published. It's a big problem. And then you solve the equations. And then you calculate the properties. Yeah. Ask me on Friday. It's what I'm going to do on Friday with a with a two D problem. <laughs> You'll see it there. Okay. So, in the remaining time, I'm now going to show you show you the results. Okay. Ask what the quality is, and I'm going to do this for up to twelve. If for this one D problem, we can go much higher. Uh, if I want to put this on a supercomputer, which I do typically do for 2D problems, I could go much higher, but I, this, this is enough to show you. First, look at the energy. Now, you've got, to look, you've got to look fairly hard here. The blue dotted lines, these blue dots, can you see the blue dots? That's classical. The black line is quantum. And that's what I said. The difference between the quantum and the classical for the energy is only is only about 5%, 6%, 7% at most. Furthermore, when you look at the energy, you don't see that this guy for the for the um, for the classical has got a phase transition at one because the energy and its first derivative are continuous. You don't see it. The same for the quantum, which is the black one. You don't see that this guy has got a it has got a phase transition at lambda equals a half because again, the, the energy and its first derivative are continuous. Now, what, what, what is being shown here, this is L sub one. And you say, well, it's not very good. Yeah, but it's only got one coefficient, right? Now do L sub two, and that's this light, light blue cyan. Is that cyan? I think that's cyan dash, uh, dash ones. And then everything else from L sub four onwards, you really hardly see because they lie on top of the black. So already at L sub four, you're almost, and L sub four has only got about, I don't know, less than 10 coefficients. So the energy doesn't, it's great, but so what? This is only the energy. So the don't, don't, don't pat yourself on the back until you've seen what it does for properties. So let's look at properties. And this is where life gets interesting. This is the icing order parameter, the one in the, the, one in the icing Z direction. Again, the blue dots, the same blue dots are classical. That was the, the, the one that dropped off as a square root, one minus lambda squared to the, to the root one minus lambda squared. So it comes down, and then of course it, it's it's zero then onwards. This is the black one is is the is the um, is the quantum going to zero at half, and much more strongly because that's the one eighth power. It shoots down. I mean, it's almost vertical at that point, right? Um, and these, so there's a big difference between the black and the blue dots, and all of the rest of these are the L sub n. So here's L sub one. Here's L sub two. Four, six, eight, ten, twelve, and what we do, what the, the thing we would like to do, as I say, 
is these are clearly not lying on top of each other now like they were on the energy, but they're piling up. The, the trend is absolutely obvious, right? The trend is we are not getting a transition at one. We're getting a transition which is it's smoothed here. Okay, it's not showing it sharply. But if I do my 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 heuristic um, uh, um, extrapolation, I get this these green circles. And the green circles are almost on top of the black. And if I went up to higher orders, they would really be totally on top. And similarly for the, um, for the guy in the, uh, in the transverse direction, this is classical. This is, the black one is quantum mechanical. Again, now it's not that the, the trends that it's it's not a, a sharp transition. It's not it, it's not going to you know it's fully saturated value except all the way out to infinity. The black guy you can prob it's it's hard but you can probably see it at a half, which is about here. That guy has got an infinite slope, and all of his derivatives are. And what you do here, this is L sub one, L sub two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. And by the time you've got to 12, you're almost on top of, on top of the black. And if I were to do an extrapolation on top of that, I, I don't do it because it, it's fully on top of the black. You wouldn't see it. So the results converge well, clearly show the quantum critical point is not at the classical. The extrapolated results are very accurate. This is just a tutorial example, right? Um, just bear with me, I'm almost finished. Um, and what I say is, this is now an advertisement, I suppose, for Friday's, for Friday's talk. This success for the 1D chain is now matched. In fact, it's, it's more than matched by a whole slew of examples for 2D um, where we don't have, typically we have no exact results in, in 2D, uh, even for the simplest possible models. Um, and we've done a, a whole slew of, the, of these, of, of these uh, sorts of, of problems, one of which I will, I will talk about on Friday. Um, and there's a large number of papers that have, have by now been done. And I'll just give you a, a flavor of the success in the interesting case, not the tutorial example case on Friday. Please ask your question. This one, previous one, yep, this one. Well, it's, it was this, this guy, if you remember, um, this um, MZ here, where's the pen? The, I, I can go back, but it's the, M, the MZ exact, the exact solution is um, one minus lambda squared. It's got to go to zero at uh, a half. It's got this one eighth power. So I don't, you have to decide what you want to call that. Right? Um, but that, that's the exact expression. That's why it's, it's so much sharper. This is the square root. This is one minus lambda squared to the power half. Yeah, yeah. And you see that's exactly what's happening. As you go to higher orders, What's happening is this inf this very very steep guys is of course by any means is very hard to follow. So these guys are doing their best. They're peeling off. The, the, the low orders peel off faster. The higher orders peel off slower. But they all ultimately they always peel off. Um, this is an artifact of a problem that is exactly soluble. It turn, I mean, exactly soluble problems are actually the most difficult to do in a, in a universal approximation scheme. That's well known. And it's, um, they're very, from that point of view, they're very artificial. 
real problems in, in, in the sense that real problems that can't be solved analytically, the convergence, it's strangely, works much better. But that's the way it always goes. So in a sense, this is, you know, this is a toy model. It's a tutorial model, but it's a tough model for any, for any um, quasi-analytic methodology. Did it answer your question? Or did you still have a question left? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's always a bit hard to know how to how to define orders of transitions. I mean, if you define. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the the usual way of well, the the ones that you the, from 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 statistical mechanics or from um, yeah, I mean, let's say from uh, from thermal physics, the a, a thermal phase transition you would say was second order if the if the energy and its first derivative were continuous, free energy, let's say, and the higher derivatives were 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 not. So by that definition, this is a second order transition. Um, if you want to get more precise and define things like critical exponents, then this, this, this one eight becomes a, becomes a measure of the criticality. And perhaps that's the question you were asking. Yeah. Yeah. The next figure. This one? Oh, sorry, I've gone the wrong way. Yeah, sorry, sorry. This is the transverse direction. Yeah, that's right. At, at this point, at one half, this guy is, you know, I mean, if, he, if you sort of blow him up, he's doing, he becomes infinite. And then, but at that point, not only is this slope infinite, but every, de, every higher order derivative is is also is also infinite so this is you know it's very infinite <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, I mean, you know, these different models exhibit, a, you know, an, an incredibly interesting array of different of different phenomena. Which n? You mean the L sub n? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean the, you know, it's it's very in in this in this uh, in this particular case. It's quite difficult, you know, to, to define to define these orders. It's always difficult, but uh, you know, if you were to look, if you were to look at the icing, at just the icing um, order, at the icing magnetization, and you look at any of the L's, there isn't a transition, right? This, these are smooth. This is smoothly going to zero, but it's becoming sharper and sharper. If you go, on the other hand, to um, if you go on the other hand to to um, to to uh, this guy, both the exact and the L sub have nothing. The only thing that's 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 sharp is 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 this is the is, is if you like is the slope. Nothing's going to zero. It's so you know. It's all a question of what you look at. In the case of, in the case of, um, let me call them real problems. I mean, this, this, I mean, this is a real problem, but it, it's in this class of measure zero that's exactly soluble, and that makes them really special. Um, in, in the class of, of real problems, what we find is that at every L sub level, we actually get an actual critical point. You don't see it here because of this very special, uh, very special transition. 
I'll show you on Friday cases where at each level of L sub M, you actually can go out to a certain value of the, of the coupling, and then your you simply can't find a solution beyond that. And your solution just stops. I mean, in reality, it goes off into the complex plane. But in the real, in the, in the, in the, in the world of, of real numbers, it simply stops. And as you go higher and higher orders, the place where it stops asymptotically approaches the actual critical point. So you get a better picture than you do, than you do here. And I'll show you some of that on Friday. Which, which perhaps will be a bigger interest. This, this toy problem doesn't show that. But as I say again, the reason for doing it was we, you know, I could actually show you, at least at the lowest order, I could show you all of the algebra. So. I, I've finished, I think. <laughs>